Hello, and welcome to Heart Senses, The Pulse, where we tackle conversations in cardiovascular care. Today, we will discuss the effects of heart health in connection with contact sports. I am joined today by our co-founder of HeartSense, Dr. Antoine Keller, and our special guest for today, Dr. Lance Lamott. Dr. Lamott is an interventional cardiologist at Baton Rouge Cardiology Center. Dr. Keller and Dr. Lamott, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, hey, Sabrina. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I am really happy to be having Dr. Lamott on today, and I don't know why it's taken us this long to have him come and do an episode with us, because he's a wealth of knowledge, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to getting into the weeds on this one. Well, yeah, well, good to be here. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm really excited about this episode. I am an avid sports fan. Not so great at playing them, but I love to watch them. And um, this made me really think about contact sports and heart health, not a huge discussion, but stuff has been happening in the sports world lately that we need to kind of bring this back to the forefront. So let's get started with the questions. So what are the most dangerous contact sports that can affect one's heart health? And I will start with Dr. Lamont. Well, you know, contact sports are, um, you know, they, they kind of captivate us, you know, they, uh, you know, draw large crowds. And so, yeah, I mean, we can approach this discussion from several, uh, from several vantage points. And obviously what's at the forefront of everyone's thoughts now are what happened a couple of weeks ago during the NFL game with DeMar mm -hmm. Hamlin. And so it brought yeah. forth a discussion about, you know, the worst um, you know, event that occur, can occur in the setting of contact sports, which is you know, sudden death on, 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 a, on a playing field. So and I'm so, gonna cut to the um, chase, Dr. Lamont, if you don't mind. Every mama that's watching right now and wants to know if they should let their child play uh, tackle football. <laughs> so I would like for you to kind of expound upon uh, how rare something like what happened to Damar Hamlin is and how uh, likely it is that someone playing football at any level uh, might uh, have to endure that kind of an injury. Sure, in, in terms of specific cardiac risk for, I guess, contact sports in general and football in particular, that risk is exceedingly low to have a tragedy like what we observed occur. And that was really a, such a rare occurrence. The overwhelming opinion that exists in terms of what happened to this young man was an event called commotio cortis, um, which was a sudden impact with enough force and at the very uh, precise timing in the cardiac cycle that caused his heart to immediately stop. And so the, the stars have to align so perfectly for this to occur that you know the, the the chance of us seeing that again in our lifetime on a in a football field especially is is pretty low. Now it is certainly reported. We see this probably a little more frequently, and, and it's a rare event. But when it does occur, it occurs a little more frequently with other sports. And football is not at the top of the list of sports where this is uh, this is seen. It's a little more prevalent, let's say, in youth baseball, where you know you have. Hmm. A, a high velocity, uh, you know, object coming that, and, it, and again, it would have to strike um, a person right at the li right location with enough force and at the right timing in the heart cycle hmm. to cause this event to occur. So if we're being asked uh, about the safety of football in terms of this sort of event happening, it is, it is a safe endeavor. Um, and you're more likely to suffer orthopedic injuries or, you know, other types of trauma mm -hmm. than having a specific cardiac event on a football field. And do you think it would be safe to say that the fact that everyone there uh, who was able to get to him in a timely fashion knew CPR probably saved his life? Well, absolutely. I think the good that's going to come of this is a public awareness about the importance of um, you know, having wider availability of external defibrillators, um, mm -hmm. rapid administration of resuscitation efforts, because often we can think if you're 
um, you know, at home or in your workplace and someone collapses, your first response, if you're not a trained medical person, is to panic and say, oh my God. But when we know what that person needs is immediate care, immediate CPR, chest compressions. Mm -hmm. And if you have access to an external defibrillator, the immediate application of this device. And, and that is the life-saving intervention. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, yes, it's going to be, adrenaline is going to be high. There's going to be um, anxiety and panic, but you have to, those, those precious few minutes are critical. And so hats off to that, um, uh, the, the athletic trainers, the response team that was able to, um, to get to this young man. Uh, my specific yeah. experience that night, I, I wasn't watching the game, but my phone started ringing right away. And, <laughs> uh, I'm literally on the phone with the guy. He says, what happened? What do you think happened? And before there was any discussion, I said, oh, that's probably commotio cortis. Mm. Um, you know, the other thought was, you know, does he have some, again, and I don't know if this is the official opinion of his healthcare providers, but just looking at the sequence of events, if, if uh, he had a pre-existing cardiac condition, first of all, mm -hmm. these athletes are tested. They go through rigorous evaluation. Um, you know, the NFL is, is very uh, good at, at screening these athletes. At, particularly at that level. And so the chance that he would have escaped to a professional, um, you know, uh, athletic, you know, career without mm -hmm. having uh, an underlying cardiac condition diagnosed is pretty rare. But, you know, just the sequence of events, that's, that's probably commotion accord. It's just the way it happened, sort of the few seconds it took for him to kind of lose consciousness. And, you know, what we see mm -hmm. in the hospital setting. Uh, yeah, my phone started ringing too, but, you know, I'm a surgeon. So my initial... Uh, uh, response was, was that he dissection. had an aortic transection yeah. or a dissection yeah. or something oh. like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Deceleration injury, you know, but I'm glad that it was not that for his sake. And uh, so the um, good news I, is he I can think, probably, I mean, I would think that if, if, if we're correct in that and he does not have any structural cardiac abnormalities, I mean, he could probably play again. You know, I'm sure that his, his I mean, really. His team may be nervous. His his family is probably <laughs> going to forbid it. But uh, yeah, and the owners know. too. They're probably the being real nervous yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's great. Well, I, I'm glad that everything turned out okay for him. And it's certainly been an education for me uh, uh, getting to understand this problem because it's not something that uh, I have ever come across before. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, might not ever have to come across it again. Hopefully, uh, at least right. certainly not in person. Right. So I want to ask you a question, too, about athletes in general, um, uh, since we're on the subject of athletes and heart disease and sudden cardiac death. You know, one of your partners, Dr. Kelly, has a, a foundation in which he tries to uh, assist young athletes and try to keep them from having uh, sudden cardi cardiac death associated with, with what they call an athlete's heart. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so if you look across the spectrum of, um, you know, sudden cardiac death in athletes, probably the most common condition is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So yes, Dr. Kelly's organization is meant to screen primarily for that, but through his efforts, he is able to capture many other things. As he screens young athletes, he sees mm -hmm. valve disease. He'll see high blood pressure in young adults. And so uh, it's a great uh, program that he has. Uh, but if you look across the spectrum, again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a specific condition where there's abnormal thickness of the heart muscle that can predispose to very dangerous and sometimes lethal uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. And it usually occurs like after exertion. So, And um, in, in athletes, it, it is more common in people who are athletic or? Uh, so there's, there, there's a fine line of discussion. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic condition that uh, where there's a predisposition to abnormal thickness of the heart muscle. And that dis that's a distinction to be made from an athlete's heart, where an athlete's heart will typically thicken in response to their high volume and intensity of training. And so we've mm -hmm. come to understand that there's different types of change mm -hmm. that an athlete's heart can, under can, can undergo. So for instance, your um, strength athletes, so your weightlifters, your powerlifters have um, what we call a pressure load hypertrophy, such that the muscle will thicken um, and the cavity is actually, you know, fairly preserved. And your mm -hmm. endurance athletes, your swimmers, your uh, marathoners, mm -hmm. they have what's called a volume 
um, uh, hypertrophy where they have, you know, their chambers may enlarge some. And, and, and studies have shown that the majority of these people, um, you know, they've done some um, deconditioning studies where they de detrain. And so they basically mm. sit these athletes down. Most of them will, um, most of that hypertrophy will recede, although in some, some uh, of those hmm. athletes, it may persist. The majority will recede if they, if they stop training. Um, so that distinction is to be made. And sometimes it's a little tricky. So African-American athletes may have a little bit of a higher uh, volume of, uh, you know, uh, cardiac muscle, you know, uh, compared to other populations. And so that has mm -hmm. to be taken into consideration uh, based upon the athlete. Um, but, you know, that, that is thought to be the athletic part is thought to be a physiologic adaptation to their intensity and frequency of exercise, as opposed to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, the, the pathologic version is, is, mm -hmm. is, is much more concerning because there is a predisposition to malignant arrhythmias, which can be fatal. And so how do both of those differ from hypertensive cardiomyopathy, people who yeah. have uncontrolled high blood pressure for a long time? Sure. And that's a, that's a pathologic uh, uh, change where the muscle thickens. Um, you know, there's, you know, without getting in the weeds too much, you know, we'll sometimes see uh, what we call outflow tract obstruction in those who have the genetic form, the inherited form, um, like our, our patients with really uh, poor blood pressure control, the, the hypertensive hypertrophs. Um, mm -hmm. They can develop other problems, as you know, stroke, uh, heart attack, uh, heart, heart failure, other things, kidney failure. Um, and, and those may regress to some degree if we get their blood pressures under control. Um, that was that, my next that's, question. Yeah. yeah, and then so there have, have been some studies to show that you can um, invoke uh, regression with better blood pressure control. Uh, that's good. So the take home message from that is if you have high blood pressure and you say, oh, no, I'm, I'm just an athlete, uh, uh, but I still have left ventricular hypertrophy. If I take my medicine, I might have some LV mass regression to the point where my heart can go back to normal and reduce my risk. Yes, yes. So but, you know, you, you we we. I'd be really concerned about an athlete who is um, really pushing to their limits during training or competition. And you can imagine, we know that the blood pressure rises, vascular resistance mm -hmm. rises, mm -hmm. and that places tremendous stress on the aorta. I mean, and so, you know, we, you've seen aortic dissection, tears of the aorta um, yeah. uh, and other things that can arise directly as a result of these extremely high blood pressures. We see it when we do treadmill studies all the time. Some people will come in and they'll generate blood pressures of 230 and 240 on, on our treadmill right. in the office. Um, and okay, so, so if you're hypertensive that. and you're an athlete, then that's a double whammy. It's even more yeah. risky for you to be doing this. Yes, I, I would be very concerned about that risk, mm -hmm. and especially the risk that it places on, on the aorta. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yes. Now, you know, we, we talk about exercise and let's just talk about you know we know that exercise is good and mm -hmm. i like to tell patients you know because i see some people who are into um you know marathons or i see some triathletes like so yourself i'm not i'm not a triathlete uh but but I, I i do love exercise and i probably do a little bit too much of it but <laughs> we think that you should stay in the middle of the bell-shaped curve so clearly no exercise is detrimental to your health but there are lots of things that can occur as we discuss the, the adaptation to training and um, what is the appropriate intensity. So on the other end of the spectrum, the extremes of exercise can have some detriment as well. There have been studies mm -hmm. that show that people who uh, are uh, like our, our endurance athletes, some of our highly, um, you know, our, our marathoners, our swimmers, ultra our, marathoners, ultra marathoners, people, yeah. that that's generally, you know, okay, but it comes at a cost and there's definitely unequivocally mm. a higher incidence of coronary artery calcification because mm. of some of the shear stress that's placed. There's mm. definitely a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation. Um, really? Yes. Um, and that has, that has been proven. So I like to tell my patients, you know, stay in the middle, you know, and you can run a 5k, a 10k, a marathon, a half marathon, just maybe don't um, you know, be the, the guy trying to win it. You know, and most of my mm -hmm. people are you know, middle-aged. And so um, 
And then you and don't be an extreme couch potato either. Then, huh? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's clearly not. Good. And so you know, generally the person training is going to be in better health than the couch potato. But sometimes these events make news, and so you'll hear somebody mm. dropping dead at a marathon, and you know everyone's like, oh, this guy ran all the time. He's in such good shape. Now, hey, we don't know their history if they recently started running and if they kind of had maybe an unhealthy lifestyle prior and had some existing mm-hmm. disease that this training and competition, mm-hmm. um, you know, brought, brought to, to, to bear. Um, mm-hmm. Or if, you know, there's just something about those extremes that may be a little bit of a detriment. Um, so the other take home message is if you start a workout program, make sure you go and see your doctor first. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you make sure that uh, you've had a good thorough evaluation. Um, you know, the, the, and as you know, there are very, very few conditions where we tell people not to exercise, maybe mm-hmm. critical aortic stenosis and maybe some mm-hmm. other um, uh, conditions like that. We would discourage it. But for the most part, we, we rarely withhold exercise from people. But um, the Heart Association endorses moderate intensity. And maybe if it's um, if there are no pre-existing conditions, you know, high intensity exercise a couple of days a week is, is supported by the American Heart Center. And so that brings yeah. to mind another question about the frequency of exercise. You know, back in uh, when we were in college, the American Heart Association said, well, you need at least three days of exercise that gets your heart rate to a certain level for at least 30 minutes and 60 minutes for weight control. Then they went up to five days a week. And now they're saying every day, if you can, what is your opinion about that? Well, if they say most days. So the Heart Association says 150 minutes a week, which is about 20, 30 minutes, most days of the week. Mm. And you can pair that with a couple of days of high intensity training, a couple of days a week. So mm-hmm. You, you know, and you have to use yeah. a little a little bit of judgment, but our message is something with consistency. Um, mm-hmm. That's such a great that point. Establish these lifestyle habits that are going to probably impact health more than all the prescriptions that we send out. Um, right. And I think if we can incorporate these lifestyle changes, we you know, have a much better uh, and healthier population overall. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So, I do have a follow-up question, Dr. Lamott. So you mentioned high intensity interval training, which is something I used to do, but then I had heard from a friend that was a cardiologist that I should probably take the back seat on doing it all the time. Can you talk about why HIT would be something that could maybe stress the heart more than usual and could cause problems for, I guess, the average person, not so much the athlete? Yeah, for the average person, and, and, and I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm going to give you a biased answer <laughs> because okay. I do it, and that is my, I have to plug into that or I'm not right. So this morning, we went to the track to go run, and the track was locked, and I am ruined today because I wasn't able to get <laughs> my, my fix. Uh, so, but... Um, I, I would say, again, if you are, for instance, I've been doing CrossFit for about 10 years. And so in CrossFit, which is HIT, you, we redline just about every day. And, you know, I have personally had atrial fibrillation. And mm-hmm. the reality is it's probably related to the fact that, you know, I'm redlining every day. I'm getting my heart rate re- up high every day. And, you know, my blood pressure during exercise is probably going up. So this, that repetitive stress, you know, like, like we talked a few minutes ago, is, you know, comes, comes at some cost. Um, and so for the average person, I would say that something le- less intense, I don't think there's anything wrong with high intensity interval training. Is, is my answer, yeah. but it has to be done with some degree of moderation. Um, there has to be, you know, adequate screening and evaluation to make sure that there's clearance to do so. And you have to know your, your limits mm-hmm. such that you're not injuring yourself or, or putting yourself at risk. So uh, that brings to mind a very important question for you to share with people uh, about the intensity of their exercise. People say, well, you know, I, I walk, five times a week, and they walk two blocks in an hour, and really is a leisurely pace. And so uh, my 
uh, friends who walk a lot tell me that you have to get your heart rate up to a certain level uh, before the exercise really has an impact on your cardiovascular <clears throat> fitness. And I know there are a lot of intricate calculations that you could give to uh, tell someone uh, what their ideal heart rate is for their exercise. But one of the most important things is to get a heart rate monitor. They have, yeah. They're very cheap these days. You can wear them on your wrist, but yeah. And so can you tell us what, what a good goal uh, heart rate would be for someone who's, say, 50 years of age who uh, wants to get out there and try to do some exercise to improve their cardiovascular fitness? Yeah, that is a, that is a very uh, difficult question to answer because the heart rate um, is dependent upon so many variables your level of conditioning. So if you have been on the couch for years and you're, this is your first couple of days, you, you know, you're gonna probably struggle um, to, to you know, get out and do much. And your heart rate is gonna shoot up as soon as you place those demands. Again, we see it on the treadmill all the time. And I just had one yesterday where someone walked two minutes on the treadmill, which is, you know, tells me a lot about their pre-existing conditions. So yes, most of these treadmill studies we do, we're looking to get people's heart rates to a certain uh, level, but not in two minutes. So what that spoke mm -hmm. to is that this person was extremely deconditioned. So, but, you know, assuming that there's, you know, some level of, uh, you know, pre-existing, some pre-existing level of conditioning, we strive to get people to get somewhere around 70 or so percent of their, their maximum heart rate, which is a simple calculation of 220 minus age, so 70% of that value um, is, mm, kind of a, okay. is kind of a good goal. Um, and, you know, 70 to 80%. And, you know, when we do stress testing, we try to get people to 80% of that, that um, calculation. And so, so but again, medications can impact your heart rate, mm, your, mm. you know, volume status, if you're dehydrated, your heart rate may go up. Um, so all mm. those things are going to come into play and your level of conditioning, all that. And then the amount of intensity of, of, of activity um, will, will impact it as well. And so, but my message is, you know, you, is just staying committed to it. And so, you know, obviously day one, your physiologic responses are going to be different than if you've been doing it for three to six months. You know, you're going to be much more conditioned if you stick to it. Your heart rate response may be less uh, uh, prominent given the level of condition. So as your level of conditioning improves, your heart rate uh, will, will likely uh, change less. And it's good to have a buddy while you're doing it, too, to keep you honest, huh? Yes, yes. And so accountability is, is, yes. is key. I was going to say, yes, the accountability definitely needs to be there. Um, in, in my case, for exercising, but <laughs> I do love it. And running is a big thing for me. So when you were talking about 5Ks, I do those about every other day. And mm -hmm. um, that's just, yeah, it's interesting to hear how that can even, I can be affecting my heart health with doing yeah, that type so of exercise. Yeah, at, so at that level, you're still, you know, that, that would still be, you know, not considered super extreme, but, you know, some people do more than that. And there are some papers to suggest that if you're running more than 30, 40 miles a week, then, you know, you're on the far end of that mm -hmm. bell curve and you may be exposing yourself to, you know, coronary calcification, atrial fibrillation. And, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just kind of bringing it back to um, the athlete's heart and um, thinking about the athlete's heart for contact sports versus a non-contact. You were talking about swimming and um, also there was the other um, sport that you mentioned that wasn't football, that was not a contact sport as well. So it's interesting to know that you can still be affecting your heart health and getting that um, larger muscle and those left ventricle, um, yeah. even if you're not making contact with another player and you're kind of like in oh, your sure. lane and focused. So Yeah. So it's just, um, you know, these, these endurance sports, you know, just the, the cardiac output demands that are placed on the heart. You know, most of these uh, athletic hearts will have larger chamber sizes, you know, so very commonly we'll see the right ventricle um, you know, the, the size will be larger just because of the increased output that the heart endures. But again, it's thought to be a physiologic adaptation and not anything uh, pathologic. 
Um, so, and do, uh, Dr. Lamont, you're a big fan of uh, uh, boxing fitness. Uh, you have a place that you like called Title Boxing. And so tell a little bit about uh, the cardio part of the boxing and how it's not as much of a contact sport as you think it might be if you do it uh, as part of a cardiovascular workout. Yeah, so... For those of you guys who have not tried boxing, I would encourage you, if you have access uh, in, your, in your locales, to just, just try it. It is like no other. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a t people think it's just an arm workout, but it is a total body experience. It requires footwork. Uh, there's hand-to-eye coordination. Uh, it does work your shoulders and arms, but it also works your legs if you're if you're moving properly, um, you know. And and it really incorporates all the senses. It's called the sweet science, you know, for for yeah. for a reason. And so, but yes, we do. We own a fitness club, and so you know, a boxing fitness club, and it's non-contact. I absolutely can't afford to lose any more brain cells in my in my profession. <laughs> so, but, um, it 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 is a uh, a stress reliever. And so it can help with your emotional health as well, because there's mm -hmm. something therapeutic about being able to punch something. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, if you mm -hmm. can uh, just kind of, we have people come in <laughs> and one of our slogans is leave it on the bag. And you know, we oh, tell okay. people whatever, that bag can be whatever for you. It can be the stressful job, it could be, your finances, it could be, you know, your personal relationships, it could be your physical challenges, it could be uh, wh whatever. Absolutely. <laughs> so, but well, that's yeah, fantastic. Is a cardiovascular um, exercise, but it also can build strength, it can help define muscles, it can alleviate stress. I've had people who have lost, some of our really loyal members <clears throat> have lost 30 and 40 pounds by coming consistently. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're just so, so much into it. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a great, um, you know, soul activity or many of our members also have, uh, memberships at other health clubs or, or facilities and they come and, and use that as a compliment. And so, uh, it, it's, it's an amazing workout. And so if you look at it, but you also turn on the TV and see some boxers who have maybe not the, uh, physique that you would expect um you, you look at uh, for instance tyson fury he's he's now mm -hmm. you look at tyson fury now but you, if you look at where he was you know when he he sort of uh you know stepped away and gained a whole lot of weight but he lost it but even with his physical uh frame being what it is the man is in amazing amazing yeah. shape Mm -hmm. um, and so I would challenge anyone who thinks it's uh, it's for, you know, just 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 an easy go, just get in the ring for three minutes and just just and, and even if you don't have a bag, even shadow boxing. Uh, can mm -hmm. the same. I'm scared uh, of it. You know, I'm an old man. I got to watch myself now. You Maybe just, in my you younger just, day. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say just even shadow boxing. Would do it. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would I would encourage it, anyone great. to give it a try. It, it's, it's amazing. And it can help support any other um, athletic endeavors. Mm -hmm. mm. That's yeah. interesting that boxing can be a positive aspect for your heart health versus thinking that it'll do anything with the, the um, excuse me, the my cardiomyopathy that could possibly mm -hmm. happen. We're, we're yeah, seeing so the good side of of we, those kinds of um, yeah so we have had athletic teams we've had uh, uh high school basketball teams come we've had uh volleyball teams come we had some lsu football players come for hmm. a couple of sessions hmm. um we've had some uh ex-football players uh as members that have really have had a good time in there and some cardiologists and nurses and cardiovascular Th people that, too. that's huh? right that's right yeah Wow. Well, I think we covered a lot about the athletes heart. Of course, the incidents with the recent Bills and Bengals NFL game um, with Mr. Hamlin. And then also kind of just um, going back to athletes versus the younger 
athletes that aren't quite there that are, you know, in middle school and high school and they're playing sports. Is there any way that those potential players or children per se are assessed prior to starting a sport to figure out a heart condition um, or how they would best identify that while they're playing? So, yeah, that's, that's great. And I'm, I'm glad we're going to touch on this before uh, this session ends. Um, I, I think everyone who's engaged in, in um, regular competitive sports should have the most basic of, of screening evaluations, which would include an evaluation at a minimum by a primary care physician who is adept at picking up on the subtleties of heart murmurs and EKG interpretation. So most um, physical abnormalities that are going to exist with the heart will manifest either with uh, something that we can hear with the stethoscope or see, um, you know, upon inspection of the chest or looking at an EKG. And so that often will provide clues that, you know, you should dig a little bit, a little bit deeper. Um, speaking specifically about commotio cordis and with DeMar Hamlin, that's very rare on a football field. It's a little more, you know, out of the, the small number that are of cases that are seen, it's more prevalent in youth baseball and in sports like hockey, lacrosse, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the, the object is smaller, so the force is more directed in one location in the chest. And so rather than the diffuse kind of impact that, you know, uh, American football players sustain. Um, but, and also there's some thinking that, you know, the, the, the bone structures of kids is not the same as a young adult might, you know, who's playing football. And so the, the force that can be delivered uh, can have a greater impact on, on, on kids. So that's an unpredictable event. But generally speaking, the screening that I, I think everyone should have is a basic physical examination to include a good, thorough uh, auscultation by an experienced provider who can also um, appreciate physical no anomalies and interpret an EKG, and that's a, that's a minimum. Um, so, yeah. the, the other piece again, going back to the having uh, resuscitation equipment at at public gatherings. So at the ball and park, knowing CPR, and knowing CPR, uh, knowing CPR, everyone, um, and 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 the facilities, the gymnasiums, and the ballpark should have. Uh, defibrillators available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And so just one thing about the defibrillators, you don't have to know how to shock somebody like on, on uh, Gray's Anatomy because the device usually will be able to assess and do all of that for you, right? You just have to put the pads on and stand away, right? Right. So these devices uh, have, have made them such that probably a seven or eight year old could operate it. And so obviously adrenaline is gonna be going, but all you have to do is open the pack and there's a diagram that illustrates, place one pad here and another pad here and push the power button and it will talk to you. It'll say analyzing or it'll say shock or it'll say administer mm -hmm. CPR or, or, or chest compressions. And so it's really foolproof, but you gotta get the device on um, and, you know, and, and if you have someone with you, hopefully someone is doing CPR while this device mm -hmm. is being, uh, mm -hmm. being applied, but yes, it's pretty, pretty foolproof. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. And, and, and while someone's calling 911 and, 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 mm -hmm. and doing CPR, but that, because that time is precious and that can make the difference between complete recovery of brain function. Even if you, you know, if, if the patient's going to be uh, going to survive, you, you want to make sure that their brain doesn't suffer from a prolonged uh, arrest. Absolutely. Wow. Dr. Keller, do you want to add any final statements? Or No, I really appreciate Dr. Lamott coming on. He's obviously an expert in the field and has a lot of thoughts about uh, these particular problems because he's been dealing with them for upwards of 20 years in practice now, Dr. This is, this is This is year 22 started very good i just started my 22nd year as well yeah. so i really appreciate your expertise and your commitment to uh educating people in the community your commitment to keeping people fit and uh, i admire you and consider you uh someone that i look up to very much so thank you very much for coming on like likewise
Yes, thank okay. you so much, Dr. Lama and Dr. Keller for joining us on this Pulse episode. I'm Sabrina, your host, and stay tuned for more episodes in season two.